Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton, Kelly Barner with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Kelly, how are you doing? Good morning. Actually, good afternoon now that it's noon, at least East Coast U.S. Well, glad to be back. It's wonderful to be back. Uh, we've gotten so, so much great feedback from the first episode of Dial P, which we really enjoyed. And, and this is, uh, I should say the formal name, Kelly, Dial P for Procurement which is a little play off of uh, Alfred, uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie. And it dialed in on the topic, uh, the ever more important topic of procurement. And and, yes. and certainly it, it's important role across global supply chain, but really across global business. And Kelly, it's wonderful to partner with you and our friends over at Buyers Meeting Point to make this happen. So tell me, Kelly, after the first show, what was, what was some, one of the key takeaways you had from our first live stream? I think the key takeaway that I had is just how big our community is. I was absolutely amazed at the number of people reaching out. I was thrilled watching the names of friends and colleagues go by even during the live stream and then hearing from folks that viewed it on demand afterwards. Um, and it's it's nice because a lot of businesses think of, you know, you have supply chain over here, you got procurement over there. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really a, a big, big interrelated community. And there's a lot of bonds between what people might otherwise divide into separate teams or functions. So it was, it was nice to hear from a whole range of people. It certainly takes a village to get business, global that business done these days. Well, hey, speaking on that, let's say hello to a few folks before we, we rattle off a couple of program notes and introduce our home run guests here today. Stand by. Yes. We've got two incredible guests for the second edition of Dial P. But in the meantime, Adem is tuned in via LinkedIn. Great to see you here. Uh, Scott Hill is also good evening. Uh, we'd love to know where y'all, hey, we'd love to know where y'all are tuned in from, by the way. So Scott, good evening to you via LinkedIn. Uh, Prerna via LinkedIn as well. Hello, great to have you here. Peter, Peter's back. Totally stoked for this one. Hey, Peter. Woo -hoo, he says, we got the woohoo <laughs> in there, Kelly. I demand enthusiasm. <laughs> Peter, great to see you back. Look forward to connecting with you on Friday. Philip, the one and only Philip Idison, Art of hey, Procurement, Phil. my mastermind. Looks like he's down in Orlando, Kelly. Yeah, which is warmer than Texas. So <laughs> anybody weird... that manages to join us from Texas, good for you for having electricity and spending some of it on us. <laughs> Muhammad uh, via uh, YouTube, great to see you once again. You've been holding down the fort there for us on YouTube. Thanks so much. And he is uh, via Saudi Arabia. So great to have you with us, Muhammad. Uh, let's see here. David, David is back. Of course, uh, David, thanks so much for tuning in yesterday as well. Uh, enjoyed our $20 bill uh, discussion there. AJ tuned in via LinkedIn from India. Great to have you here, AJ. Uh, let's see. Irfan from Delaware via LinkedIn. Great to see you here, uh, Irfan. And of course, we can't do this without Clay Phillips, the dog behind the scenes, <laughs> along with Amanda. And, and just to make that connection, he just graduated in December from the University of Georgia, home of the Bulldogs. And uh, he, he and Amanda make things happen behind the scenes. Okay. So quick programming note, Kelly. Yes. If folks enjoy this conversation, I think there's two places I would direct them to. Uh, that would be Supply Chain Now via podcast, wherever mm -hmm. you get podcasts from, but also Art of Procurement, right? Where, where y'all have a ton of wonderful procurement-related thought leadership discussions. Absolutely. And This Week in Business History which uh, I recently got to, to guest host. If you enjoy the business and you enjoy the history, you will adore this week in business history, the podcast. It's so fun. Love that Kelly. And, and, you know, and you did a, you did a masterful job and we talked about, or you talked about and kind of offered up an historical um, point of view on the word robot. If you, if you're curious about where that came, word came yes. from and why there's not going to be a lifetime special about certain elements. <laughs> Actually, related. maybe lifetime, not Hallmark Channel, but it might Hallmark. make it lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I was changing networks on you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get down into and, and welcome everybody. Great to have you here. You're, you're up in for a treat. We've got two outstanding guests here today. Please join me and Kelly in welcoming Jeffrey Ostrander, head of supply transactions, Western Hemisphere for Slumberger, the world's leading oil field services provider and 
if if that isn't enough, we've got a second awesome guest, Ragnar Lawrenson, Chief Commercial Officer at Hicks, which has been optimizing suppliers' experience for all parties since 2011. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you? No, I'm doing great. Welcome, Excited. guys. Very good. I'm stoked, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Kelly, let's see. We're going to start yes. with our infamous lightning round, which has become less and less lightning and more and more rounds of questions. But we're get, we got two questions as we're going to kind of uh, have our audience and community get to know you both a little bit better. So, Jeff, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you know, in these days of, of working from home offices and certainly working remotely, we're all are using a wide variety of platforms. Some we love. Some I was just reading on Twitter. Uh, it, there, there's growing anti communities for them. But <laughs> negative, vi negative vibes aside, I, I won't even name names either. What has been you know, one of your favorite home technologies or, or electronic devices? Okay, tough one here. I'm going to give an answer, but you got to give me a second to qualify it. Otherwise, it's going to sound really ridiculous. Right? Ooh, okay, so uh, yeah, it, not really. Okay, so uh, <laughs> hands down, number one, uh, COVID era, despite all the iPhones and iWatches and iPads and everything else we have at our fingertips, is the good old fashioned coffee maker. And I'm going to qualify that. And the, and the reason I say that is because I'm living dead center, uh, middle of coffee country. And this time at home has given me a chance to leverage what I learned about coffee since moving here. And the fact that just the slight different change of the bean changes the whole taste. So to be honest with you, I've been playing around with the coffee and the, and the, and the beans and everything for the last uh, year. Uh, we've been locked down since March, right? So I'm getting to the, I'm getting to the almost, almost professional, not there yet. Uh, wow. Now, I love that, Jeff. We're going to have to get some coffee tips from you. Uh, I know. Maybe after At least to Jeff. Step. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and, and you know what? That's a great segue because as we learned in the pre-show, Ragnar, before uh, becoming a, a, a business leader in the world of supplier experiences, he was a professional chef. So Ragnar, all right. So you got to give us the goods. What's been your favorite uh, device or technology you know, gadget or platform here in this era? Well, to be honest, I was going down the, the route of, of Jeffrey. I'm, I'm extremely tempted to, to say my new egg cooker. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is not innovative, but I love it. Uh, it switches on by itself. It turns off by itself and it's ready for when I want my lunch. Uh, but uh, I, I just recently bought the Google Nest. Family loves it. Kids love it. You can ask questions, pops up answers. It's really educational. We can play music. And um, I'm, I'm one of those that exercise a lot of them. I thought I was stupid enough to use this iWatch for, for exercise. But, and one of the things that's really annoying about it is that you have to use this digital you know, instrument when you, you've been running 10K and you're trying to set a personal best and you have to fiddle when, when the stop is. <laughs> <laughs> you just press the button. And then literally last week I figured out if you press both of the buttons, you can actually pause the time. So I think this is starting to rank as my favorite now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I love that. A tip um, for everyone. <laughs> I'm a, uh, you know what? You're making me hungry uh, between coffee and eggs. Uh, <laughs> let's have some late lunch. Uh, let's say hello to a couple additional folks before we pose one more question to each of you. Anthony Clervy is uh, here via uh, Una and via LinkedIn. So great to have you here, Anthony. Hope you're doing well. Peter says, he did coffee procurement at Air Canada, working with the roaster Mother Parker's at the time. So we're going to learn a lot more from Peter. We're interviewing him on Friday. Uh, Hafiz is uh, via Pakistan, uh, uh, joining us uh, on LinkedIn. And then finally, Jack from Southampton, UK. So Jack, great to see you here via LinkedIn. Okay, next question. So uh, Jeff, you are in Bogota and Ragnar, you're in London. So Jeff, what's your favorite aspect of living in that beautiful city of Bogota? No, absolutely. So hands down, uh, it's the people. They take the cake here. It makes the whole place worth it. Super welcoming to the folks like myself, an American from the Northwest uh, landing here. Super, super outgoing, super friendly. Um, a very close second. Uh, it's a mountain city, it's high elevation, but in reality, one hour, you're in the sunlight, you're in the 90 degree weather and, and you can't pass that up. Absolutely. I love that. 
but you paint, you're painting a picture and Jeff, we're going to try to get some pictures from you, uh, in the days to come. All right. So Ragnar London, one of the, uh, the world's greatest cities and, and certainly economic capitals. What's your favorite part about living in the London area? Well, I think it's the combination. You, I have a 14 minute tram drive straight into the center of London. Uh, so it's fairly central in the Southeast where I live. But you have six enormous parks, Dulwich Park, Peckham Park, you have Crystal Palace Park, you have, you know, you have the, the birthplace of Charles Darwin in a fantastic area of just half an hour drive from, from our house. But the secret, which most people don't know about uh, our, our situation or where we're placed, is a uh, very hidden gem. Don't tell anyone. It's called the Sydenham and Dulwich Forest of Woods. And this is two minutes away from my house. And it, wow. I've been here for six years now, but still to this day, I can get lost. Me and my kids can be out there for a full day and just explore. And it's much bigger than people would expect in su such a central location. So I'll pick that one. Love that. That's um, extremely cool. So Kelly, what are we going to ask them in the lightning round next? <laughs> We've talked about what is the same with procurement and supply chain quite a lot here on Dial P, but one of the things that's very unique about procurement is that almost no one intended to end up there. And I, I happen to know, I've, I've worked with Jeff, we've been connected for years. I happen to know that like anybody else, he did not intend to end up in either procurement or supply chain. Um, and so Jeff, you come to us from finance. So what part of either that experience or the education that you had to work in those roles have you actually found to be most useful in the jobs that you've worked since? Hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, to your point, right? I, I grew up in my education. I got my undergraduate in finance. I took my first role out of college in accounting and finance. To be honest with you, the, the easy go-to would be the analytics of it, right? The, the down to the numbers, the that. But to be honest with you, where I've seen the biggest connection from that foundation in finance is, is translating the actual stakeholders needs, right? Because in the finance world, you're dealing with cash flow, you're dealing with the IBT, you're, you're looking at um, things like working capital and, and, and it's a thing we do as well, right? But in many cases, in, we get drawn into the savings, we get drawn into that aspect of the world yeah. and you lose sight of the bigger picture. And I think finance has always brought me back to center and say, wait, 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 where's this gonna hit? in the cash, where's this gonna hit on the asset side or, or what are we trying to do as a company and does that match? And I think for me, it's been the the, the two lanes to keep me kind of at least going in the right yeah. direction. Yeah. And that's tough, right? Because you can say on the one hand, yes, I've gotten to the right answer. I have all the right numbers. I have the right ratios. I have the right analytics. But what does that mean? And what are we supposed to do with that, right? That's much harder. You have to have a much broader understanding uh, in order to, to bring some actionable meaning to those numbers. Um, so similar question for you, Ragnar, although instead of talking about skills and work experience, let's talk more instead about personality traits, because I know you're someone that sort of really enjoys a startup, fast paced entrepreneurial type environment. When you think about the colleagues and the folks that you've worked with that environment, what are the characteristics? What are the personality traits that you see help people thrive and, and contribute the most in an environment like that? Sure. Can I just comment on, on, on what was said earlier? Of um, course. I think we need to get a bit more prouder on working in procurement and supply chain. You know, I think so many CPOs are saying, you know, I didn't plan this career, so you have to excuse me, but I'm still here. Uh, you know, we should, we, should, we should feel proud about working in, yes. in this function. It's one of the most important functions in, in corporate. But um, back, back to your point, uh, you know, in, in startups, you are essentially working in a high risk, low data environment. Yeah? So that's the context. Mm -hmm. You are typically driven by an enormous vision yeah? and you, a vision that you can materially differentiate, uh, you know, a value proposition to what is incumbent market solutions. Now, so I think you know some of the personality traits are, are similar to large corporates. So things like conscientiousness, for instance, you know, working hard, you know, being dependable. But I think in a in a kind of an environment like startups, there's less visibility, there's less governance, yeah. there's less processes, there's less stuff kind of watching over you. So you really have to depend on the people that you have. So that's one important thing, I think. The other thing, given you are in a low data environment, um, you have to be very flexible in your mindset, constantly looking and trailing for um, 
less patches of snow is what I kind of pictured in, in my mind and looking for data points that can be validated and that you can build on from, but you need to be flexible enough to change the direction course correct when needed. I was reading a, a Jordan Peterson video, who's big on personality traits, uh, was it a couple of weeks or months ago, and he said, by the way, intelligence is the number one predictor of corporate success, conscientiousness is number two. The biggest predictor of unsuccess or lack of success is, um, is neuroticism. Now, I think in a startup environment, being a little bit paranoid or neurotic, I'm probably extending the definition here. Right? <laughs> So every time you get a confirmation that you're doing something well, around the corner, it's all shattered again, and you have yep. to kind of build yourself up. But resilience is probably the word I'm looking for. Yeah. I don't know. I think a little bit of productive crazy helps in a startup environment. I've been in a few small business situations where, you know, as long as you can stay enough near the lines, not even necessarily inside of them, I don't know. I think productive crazy works. <laughs> <laughs> I take it. I think I think it's been a requirement uh, over the last <laughs> fifteen months or so, right? And if you don't have it when you start, you definitely get it while you're there. That's right, mate. Burned it. <laughs> well, hey, really quick, uh, I think we're going to be shifting gears here and talking about, as Kelly eloquently put it, the craft of supplier management. I want to recognize just a couple of comments here. So, Philip Addison says ninety nine percent of procurement folks fall into procurement rather than choose it in college. Looks like a lot of agreement there. Uh, Peter says, I always love when asked by finance, what's my MPV on a consumable product? What is your perspective? Uh, I, well, he's asking a question here. What is your perspective, Jeffrey, on MPV for consumables? And why would I have been asked that question? To me, MPV was about a buy-lease decision. So Jeff, feel free to comment there, or we can keep driving. Maybe circle back no, to that later. No, NPV. <laughs> NPV is always a great one, right? Especially to your point, you see it always come up if we're going to be buying or, or project related. Um, nine times out of ten, I can be honest, they're not going to like this answer. But nine times out of ten, it's a stall tactic, right? On finance, like, listen, I'm not ready to make that call. I'm going to send you down the path of more data before I before I get it. Um, but in reality, again, it's just one of those other indicators, like many things, right? We all have our grandiose ideas. We have our projects. Uh, everyone has a list of what they want to try to accomplish, and NPV always comes back to, you know, what's the value that's actually going to deliver on, right? What's the actual value uh, that you're trying to propose, and how's that stack up against everything else I'm getting shoveled my way on the finance side to fund, and I'm of course going to make a call on. But anyway. Love that. Sounds like we can have. Sounds like we could have a whole live stream dedicated to NPV. We'll see. Maybe <laughs> maybe later this month. Uh, as a lead. <laughs> Azalea, hey, good morning. Great to have you here as you continue to pursue your MBA and uh, jump into your supply chain profession. So great to see you. Um, okay, so Kelly, I don't want to get in the way of us talking about the craft of supplier no. management. Tell us more. Yeah, so we're we're going to break this apart. Anybody that checked out the title, I always try very hard to use correct punctuation. Those parentheses are there for a reason. So we're gonna break this discussion of suppliers into two pieces. We're gonna talk about the management of the suppliers and the relationships themselves. And then we're gonna kind of drill down into the concrete information and, and process that go with that. So Jeff, starting off with you, since we're gonna be Ragnar, procurement proud, our suppliers have to be our partners. So what role do you see suppliers playing and the success of the overall organization, not just procurement? No, I, that's, that's a good, good question. So uh, hands down, I'll, I'll answer it and then I'll qualify it. So hands down, it's 100% yes. Uh, for everyone on the call today that works for the product sales company, I hate to break it to you, you are an absolute a supply chain company. This is the nature of what you do. Yeah. Uh, if you're in the service industry, uh, for sure, I hate to tell you, in many cases, you're on the critical path uh, so suppliers play an absolutely critical role in what you do. I had a very good example from my own team just the other day, uh, someone that's preparing themselves uh, to go through the management track. And, and she brought up a very good example. And, and she said, listen, you know, what happens when you're working in these crazy conditions like we do as a company, right? We're a service company in the oil and gas industry. We work in super remote places, super hot places. Yeah. What happens when uh, that supplier doesn't deliver the air conditioner? What happens to the work? It's catastrophic. Uh, you know, what happens if we, we don't have the raw materials to build something on the product sales side, right? Of course, it's catastrophic. So in the end, absolutely, suppliers play the fundamental piece of it. Um, how you manage that, again, is, it's going to depend on a lot of different things. But for sure, they, they're central to the whole thing. 
Do you think we really appreciate it? I feel like this is one of those areas where for years we've been talking about supplier relationship management, but it's been a little bit of lip service, at least when you kind of paint it broadly, it's been more talking about relationships versus actually walking that walk. Do you think we're moving in the right direction in terms of getting the value from those relationships? Yeah, I think you hit on it. I, I, I think fundamentally, as a practice in a domain of supply chain and, and people understand the value that suppliers bring, it's always the ambition, right? You yeah. want that partnership, you want that supplier you can go to. Um, but the reality on the ground is it's probably one of the most difficult, I would say, disciplines and domains to get off the ground, right? Because again, That's you're competing hard. against the, the better word for it, but the sexy uh, strategic sourcing, right? They've got the events and they can show you the savings and of course they get all the attention. But uh, in the green room, I was actually, uh, I was doing a little uh, second grade art, so bear with me for a second. But uh, <laughs> I, I go back to an old manager I had, and I'm gonna give 100% credit to this because he's dynamic at making very complex things super simple. Uh, so if he's on the line today, maybe he is, Mario Freire, this is, this is yours. Uh, but he, he used to draw this super simplistic diagram of supplier management, right? So you have all this value you're creating uh, from the sourcing organization, right? You're pushing that ball up the hill, and if you're not taking care of those suppliers, you're not taking care of, of the, the end state of that, the ball eventually rolls back down, the value goes down. Yeah. So supplier management was always the stop. It was the little uh, chalk block if you're in the yeah. transportation industry, holding that ball up, right? And, and this is how I used to always explain it uh, to the rest of the organization, which still in my brain, that's why I thought of it this morning, was it, it's exactly the same reason, right? It's They are the stop gap. They're the ones yeah. that keep the value in place. Uh, of that supply base and and the the struggle for most people whether you're a big company or a small one in the small ones odds are you're a sourcing person a supplier manager person and a procurement person uh, in more mature organizations you might actually have the luxury of having that domain split and then you're you're focused on prioritizing those resources but uh, to your point uh, absolutely fundamental is it uh, oversold on ambition yes of course um, because yeah. i think they're in that constant sales yeah no, and, and it's an exhausting effort. I mean, any relationship, right? Every single person listening, procurement or not, is in some type of relationship. Doing a good job is exhausting. I love that visual, Jeff. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking like, wow. Yeah, by the way, I heard you guys last week, right? It's uh, t-shirt slogans. I think you, there's your yeah. support. But you know, you're not doing yourself. Who needs screen share? <laughs> you aren't doing yourself enough justice, Jeff. Uh, that's at least fourth grade, at least fourth grade uh, artwork there, not second. And two I'm colors. Teacher. I'm calling my teacher. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, if we could share just a couple of comments really quick from the community uh, before we switch over to Ragnar here. Peter says, hey, KPIs, service um, uh, SLAs, make them smart or they will not serve any purpose. David is a big fan of Mother Parker's. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, if I get your name wrong, I apologize. Joao. Uh, if, we, if we want to have the best suppliers of the market, yeah. we also want to be the best customers to them. This is the root of a long-term and productive partnership along the supply chain. And then finally, looks like we've got lots of agreement around what, what Joe just said. Uh, love this thinking process, as Leah says. Reminds me of the idea of any relationship, i.e. being a good communicator requires being a good listener as well. Okay, a lot of good thoughts there. So, Kelly, where are we going next? So I think we're going to come to Ragnar. I, to me, this is such an important topic because everyone, again, thinks maybe they're being a customer of choice when they're not actually. So I would love to hear your thoughts about what you have either seen change maybe over the last decade or so in terms of supplier relationship management or some really effective, meaningful practices that you're seeing companies carry out today. Yeah, sure. I mean... Try to keep it simple here. The, the biggest change from my perspective is that supplier management has gone from serving only the few strategic top suppliers. They might account for 50% or more of your spend, but they would typically only be a couple of percent of your supply base. Yeah? Yeah. Pareto doesn't exist in procurement, actually. Uh, there isn't the notion of 2080. It's more like 9010 or even 955. Yeah? So the biggest change now is that companies are thinking as the supply chain as a strategic entity, an extension of their own corporations, and they want to have be managed this as, at a strategic level. Now, I was just reading here earlier an interview with, uh, with um, Dan Bartel, uh, the CPO of Schneider Electric, 
who yeah. voted the greenest company on, on the planet uh, at the moment of any company above a billion, that he predicts already now and in the future 75% of the innovations coming into to Schneider, who is revolutionizing sustainability and energy management, uh, is going to come from startups and emerging mm -hmm. ecosystems. It's staggering to think about that. This is a complete change from how it used to be. Yeah? You got your big idea, you know, I don't want to pull on your hair, Jeffrey, but uh, Statel used to think that they got <laughs> their best idea from Schlumberger only, you know, or, or the, 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 you know, some of your competitors. That is not necessarily the, the case anymore. Yeah. So, so that mindset is changing. Um, he also quoted some, some figures that uh, the new kind of startup world is worth already $2 trillion dollars more than a G7 country on average. Wow. And if you look at the VC investments going into this, and we're taking on VC investment ourselves as a company, it's 300 billion a year into emerging startups. Huh? And procure tech and supply tech is likely now the second most invested in area uh, behind FinTech. Uh, so it's, it's quite staggering in that type of information. Now, sim supply information isn't the most sexy topic, um, but it's going through a similar um, journey like the other domain areas, like think customer, employee, uh, shareholders, product yeah. materials type of thing, um, where the first thing you typically had a very decentralized way of dealing with them, more scattergun type of approach. Then the transformation come, try to get hold of their data which is difficult when you have customers and, and suppliers and you know a lot of different product groups. So that's a transformation in its own right. But where it's going now is to more, more domain-specific experience management. You now have customer experience management platforms. You have employee experience management platforms. You have product experience management yeah. platforms. We predict that this is going to have to become more of a supplier experience management. But first, you need to get control of the data once you have that, you can then extend workflows to manage the whole supply life cycle, but in a much more coherent way. Well, I think particularly when we're, we're talking about, okay, building a supplier experience, absolutely, right? That's that's critical. We do need to care what the experience is for them because it allows that chalk block, Jeff, to be in exactly the place we need it to be. But then you bring in sort of the wild card of these startups. And even though there's more potential return in terms of the innovation that they offer, even disruptive innovation, now we're back to this point about productive crazy, right? So if, especially if you're a large enterprise and you're trying to draw all this value from your supply base, you do sort of have to figure out how to build a structure that helps those companies that don't have the type of existing framework or processes or oversight that even mid-sized companies typically have. It does create a unique kind of challenge if you want to achieve both the supplier experience and work with these somewhat, you know, radical startups at the same time. Mm. So uh, a lot of, a lot of good uh, exchanges here. Let me add Sean's two cents. He agrees using concepts and materials and reducing the volume on containers will assist in the process. And then uh, Joe, I'm going to see if not, not to cover y'all up, but really quick, uh, <laughs> not, uh, in, in his eyes, respect agreements, don't delay payments, be clear on communication and planning, ask for opinions and a lot more. So I love that, yeah. um, that, that spirit of what Joe's talking about, where it really Ragnar to, to still your comments from the pre-show. It's, it's good for all parties. It's not one sided. Right. And that's what, um, that's what I love really about many of these disciplines that we're all talking, speaking to supplier management or, or supplier experience, consume, uh, customer experience, employee experience, right? Th these, these true disciplines that have really uh, been, been developed behind those phrases where everyone wins if we get it right. And it, it, and it creates a more holistic view of the enterprise. So I think we all, all can win there. Well, I mean, collaboration, it's often thought about it's joint product development. That is something, super, you know, innovative type of thing, but it doesn't have to be, uh, yeah? You know, at that operational level, what you want to do is unkink the relationship and make it smooth and collaborate around these things. You want to have an open communication channel. You want to pull in your supply base into joint value chain objectives like sustainability and, you know, compliance and, and other type of initiatives. And still only on a subset of your supply chain is going to be more NPD, you know, collaboration type of thing. But collaboration is a lot of different things, yeah? not only what we thought it was. 
Yeah. Well said. Well said. Hey, couple quick, and, and Kelly, we'll get back. I promise. I'm trying to. Uh, so Demo is is with us here today. Demo, great to have you as part right. of the uh, the stream. As Leah says, imagine lar large corporations adopting a startup that take under their wing. And really, to that comment there, uh, I'm not sure what y'all are seeing, but we're certainly seeing here in this ecosystem we're part of corporations being much more willing to. Uh, engage in the risk that can be associated with with using startups and early stage companies. Really finding those those um, meaningful disruptive ways of of you know solving old new challenges. So I, I love to see that. All right, so Kelly, as always, our community brings it. Uh, they're 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 coming in hot today. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Where are we going next? So I think next we're going to move over more into the information side. Um, and Ragnar. As you've commented, supplier information management, not the sexiest topic, maybe. Um, so let's take a non-sexy approach and define it. <laughs> uh, how do you, when you talk about supplier information management, what in fact does that mean to you in practice? Well, let's cover a definition first. Let's be a bit boring. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try to be a bit practical. We've got a series for that, right? I know. Now. We, we need have Chris. a series for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think a good definition is um, supplier information is the ability to collect information, yeah. manage information, and make that information reusable across the entire enterprise and across any application. Yeah? Maybe a little bit uh, kind of high flying, but uh, but I think that is a good uh, good definition. But if you try to make it a bit more practical, what a SIM solution would require to, to be able to do is, one, it needs to be able to collect all the information on behalf of all the data stakeholders and all the applications across your whole enterprise. And this starts with the onboarding yeah, and the pre-qualification of a supplier. This is where you have a unique chance to collect the right information in the right format that all other systems is going to require. Yeah. So that's number one. Uh, and you need to be able to do it with a single platform uh, rather than some of our clients yeah. have 17. Uh, well, they're not clients yet, but uh, you know, with us, uh, it will improve. But some companies have up to sort of, 20 different supplier uh, platforms, which is crazy to meet your supply chain with. Yeah? Crazy so and probably inefficient and, and yeah. very fractured, right? Yeah. Next, impossible to manage. Well, think about it. All these platforms would be collecting data for different purposes. They're not thinking about the enterprise needs. So when someone at the enterprise level trying to make sense of the data and try to make it interoperable, it's it's really difficult. And companies have tried it all. They tried to clean data, you know, six months cleaning cycle, and it's all dirty again. You know, they try to to manage it in all different types of way, which is is generally not working. Including things like data lakes, which are trying to harmonize the data after the fact. But you have to collect it when it comes in. So that's number one. The, the second thing is you need to be able to manage the life cycle of that information in this single solution as well. And this now is starting to get quite complicated. Yeah. What is really a supplier? You know, is it you know, is it the the, the 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 ultimate parent? Is it the country level legal entity? Is it the manufacturing uh, location? Is it the purchasing location? Is it the invoice location? You know, all these types of things are very, very complicated. So you need a very sophisticated solution that can manage all this, this life cycle activities from onboard to extend to blocking to reactivation to changes to this information as well. So that's number two. The third thing is that you need to be able to do this on behalf of all other systems. The, the point is, you know, do you just use a single system for all this data? That is obviously not the purpose. And all different systems will have different data needs. They are data stakeholders. And you need to convert the data and manage the data on behalf of these in a seamless way so that you can create what we would refer to as data interoperability. Mm. And we've got, I mean, you talk about the scale of that, right? And it very quickly becomes apparent just how complex of a task that is to do well. So obviously there's the, the people portion, right? Because we do want at least that five or 10% to be relationships. There's the technology aspect that you have to have to achieve scale. But then what about automation? So where into this do we bring automation versus just saying, okay, really well-structured database. We have to kind of bring the processes into alignment with those databases and technology that exists. Any thoughts about what you're seeing, where companies are drawing the lines between the people, the technology, and then automation that's helping them, that's working on their behalf? 
Yeah, that's a question for me, presumably. Um, well, software can be a very important enabler, mm. I think, to, to kind of drive um, aut automation. Um, we're still not 100% there. Uh, I think if you have a single solution that can manage all your information, that gives you a lot of headway. You still need some human interventions, particularly around the workflow. Um, I think there's been a lot of uh, innovations now in doing data validation and checking, so you don't need humans to do this. You can do address validation, you can do bank account validation, you can do legal entity validation, you know, TIN match, VAT type of checks, uh, and that can all be automated today. Yeah. I think there's a lot of innovation in document checks. This is this is kind of the big one. Yeah? If you okay. could check that someone hasn't, you know, signed their ISO certificate with Donald Duck, or that it, it is a real ISO, <laughs> yeah? unless they are, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, unless they are exactly. Um, there will be a, that would probably be one of the final kind of hurdles to create full automation, uh, and that would set us up for a future, hopefully in the next two to three years, where mm -hmm. human intervention is a matter of managing by exception. So okay. when you know you need to manage something that doesn't make sense, maybe a human needs to go and intervene on that. So then I think we've got this big challenge, right? And we understand, like Jeff, from your picture, the upside of being able to put that chalk block in place and get that little circle up the value hill. That's sort of the goal. That's not something that procurement can do alone. It's not something that supply chain can do alone. It's not something operations, marketing, sales, right? It's got to be sort of everybody doing it together. And then Ragnar, you talked about that interoperability of the data, of the processes, of the value that we get from it. How do we practically, Jeff, given the size of this challenge, work cross-functionally? So the data has to be cross-functional. The technology has to be cross-functional. Certainly the goals and objectives for what we're trying to achieve have to be cross-functional. It's a massive, massive challenge. Given the, the different functional roles that you've been in, what would you say that we need to be focused on doing to move in that cross-functional direction? Yeah, so the most important thing I think I've learned on data in, in really the last 10 or so years, it's it's around, it's its own practice, right? And I think wow. once organizations realize this, that you, can, you have to have someone that's really looking at the governance really looking at what you're trying to drive from that data, right? Because the value chain, for me, use procurement as an example, right? Procurement is a creator of data. We, we produce a ton of data, right? That we want to be consuming in all the other places. The fact of the matter though is, is that we're really dependent as well. If you look at the end-to-end -end procurement, we use an example of something simplistic, right? We saw it in the comments before, you know, one of the fundamental uh, relationships we have with our suppliers is paying them, right? The interconnectivity of paying a supplier goes well beyond the procurement and the procure to pay team uh, from an accounts payable standpoint, right? If you work in a, in a multi-country or even multi-county in the US, you're talking about tax schemas, you're talking about uh, tax exemption, uh, all these other factors master data-wise that play into that same procurement transaction, which could prevent the ultimate payment, right? So you're forced then to start to realize and recognize that, I call it workflow, before we, we say we're functional or we're disciplined, but in reality, everything is a workflow procure to pay. Good example of that. So when you recognize that you have a discipline that requires managing it in the right way and taking the same approach, then it's really facilitating it, right? What backbone do you have? Are you a, a single ERP shop? Uh, or are you a multi ERP shop? Or to Ragnar's point, uh, do you have an overlay or another system on top of all those to do you your interconnection and, and make the world turn? Uh, and that becomes super fundamental. Uh, if you're a small time company or a small company, you may have less complexity to, to wrestle with. If you're a a large organization, of course, it comes much, much more complex. And to your point, uh, faster and faster and faster, the, the size and scale this becomes, yeah. right? You're talking about multi country, multi discipline, multi uh, geography issues that you need to resolve. So, until you embrace it as a practice and, and have that same mindset, you're going to struggle. So, Jeff, let's stick with you for a moment here. Let's talk about uh, bottom line impact and things like uh, business objectives like risk that we've heard and, and and we're going to keep hearing a lot more about compliance, of course, efficiencies, you know, all those things that tend to be uh, achieved through improved supp uh, supplier information management. Can you speak to some of those things? And, and perhaps where do you see the biggest opportunity for enterprises that, that really get it right? No, for sure. So uh, 
hands down, like I said before, right? Data is the king. It's been the king for a long time. It's just now finally, I think it's getting center stage. Mm -hmm. And it translates everything. If, if an organization gets their arms around this data, there's so many things. To your point, risk, right? And, and we'll use risk in a few different ways. You have the operational risk, right? Uh, you know, how do I validate to the point of anger? How do I go back and, and sustain my data to ensure that I'm not working with a denied third party? How do I make sure that someone's not on a list they shouldn't be on and I'm still using them because I have, I have a process in place to check that? Um, how do I know that, uh, and again, for, for many people uh, in the US or, or people outside the US, right? It's been super dynamic on um, simple things like embargoes, which can change overnight, right? Tomorrow it's a new one. So what does that right. impact to me? If you have master data aligned in a way that lets you answer those questions, right? One of the, one of the most common ones, if I bring it back to more straight procurement, if I go back, and think about uh, some of our recent tragic events, right? Where we actually shut down areas of manufacturing or costs of raw material, right? The most common question you get out of the C-suite is, what does this mean to us? What happens if this price of steel doubles? What am I looking at? What's the damage? How long is that damage? And, and what's the amount I'm gonna pay for that result, right? And if you look at procurement data, you're harnessing that, right? You're harnessing what I buy, the part number level, you know, uh, in a, in a perfect world and manufacturing system, you know your components that are steel-based. Imagine what that gives you as a procurement organization to answer the C-suite say, I'll tell you that, it's gonna be X amount as a result. But even better, to your point, Scott, where do we go from here? Right. Think about the dynamicism like you have in, in some of the automotive industries that can just turn off nodes. My supply node in China is off. My new nodes are activated, and now this is my new lead times, this is my new cost structure, da, da, da. For people outside of that level of sophistication, of course, this is the grail, right? We're searching uh, for that aspect. Right. But if I take it back just quickly on my side, it goes back, we've said it a few times, we talk about user experience, right? Every one of us that's in the procurement industry has for sure had someone in the executive team come to you and say, why can't I buy it like the Amazon approach? <laughs> yeah. That's my nice user interface. When am I gonna see my instant tracking? When am I gonna see my payment completely checked off? that experience from our users, whether it's internal, external, that user experience, this is what data is eventually going to drive us to, right? And the ability to consume it, produce it, uh, and link it, which is the, the point raised a few times today. How do we link it to all these other, these groups, right? And I think that is the power on the supply chain and procurement front that's in front of us, right? We get data, master data, right? We link that. We link ourselves to the business and we link it internally to manage the supply chain the way it should be managed. But as many of us that have been in the, the industry long enough, this has been the, the ultimate roadblock, right? Is how do we link those up in a way that is dynamic? Love it. Optimizing the answer to the question, so what? Uh, I love that. Let's share a couple of comments before I, I get Ragnar to chime in as well. Uh, Mike Aver, I hope this finds you well. Paying on time yeah. is critical. Peter says a new OTP used to be on time performance. Now it's on time payment. Yeah. Uh, as Leah says, I have noticed how sometimes the longevity of data is cut short, mostly because of unclear focuses when first constructing that collection process or building that database, but also the upkeep of a database that both of y'all have spoken to. And then finally, um, Mike says, hey, you could set up a commodity buyer or sell algorithm to preform much like many of the trading computers on stock exchange, Mike, that's well above my pay grade. So, uh, but it sounds fascinating. Um, all right. So Ragnar, I want to bring you in here and of course, feel free to piggyback on, on anything that Jeff shared, but what we want to talk with you about in particular next is, and we're all hearing and we'll continue to hear about digital transformation. You know, Kelly, I was catching up with our dear friend, Kevin L. Jackson this morning that leads our digital transformer series, you know, global businesses in any supply chain and well beyond are, are grappling with digital transformation. Others are getting it better, uh, are acting and executing on that much more effective, effectively than other companies. But Ragnar, given all the moving and shaking and, and the challenges and, and the uh, ambiguity, you know, I love what Jeff was just saying. Jeff, I could, I could picture the clarity that he was offering that he spoke to uh, of, of giving executives that clarity, but, but goodness, there's not enough of that. So what, when, when, when companies get digital transformation, right, what does that look like in terms of the people, the technology that the change management approaches? Well, if we have another hour or two to discuss this. <laughs> Can you do it with triangles? Can you draw yeah, yeah. what it looks like? We have a circle. Any fourth grade yeah. illustrations. <laughs> no, but uh, obviously it would be, I have to be a very short answer to this, but, uh, 
<laughs> I love that one, by the way. Uh, need some context potentially uh, to explain it. <laughs> it's, it's to force the question. Force the question on the T-shirt. That's what. There it's you like. go. <laughs> Well, I think Jeffrey is kind of saying it right. It, it needs an extreme alignment across the organization. Uh, and um, this is what's happening now with a few companies. I think if you look at Fortune 2000s, um, you know, you're know, you looking at percentages, maybe double digit of companies that have reached this internal alignment. So we almost have to assume that it's there. Um, from a people perspective, now you need very heavy business people with broad soft skills to run the transformation like this people that can community communicate with senior people people can build trust with stakeholders you know people that can do some of the hard management project management skills of course as well but are strong communicators uh, you know in 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 essence um, from from a technology point of view you need something highly flexible now, again, these early set of companies, they are getting quite fed up with very inflexible software. And, uh, you know, imagine companies like Schlumberger or, you know, our client Baker Hughes, for instance, uh, hundreds of uh, operating companies, lots of ERPs, a lot of different product companies that are operating quite uh, decentrally. The only way you're going to achieve success is to give them what they want. Mm. Yeah cannot you know introduce another enterprise solution on top of them and say yeah. don't worry about it this is for the sake of uh, you know this is for the sake of everyone but unfortunately you're going to have to suffer a little bit but how you do your business and when you know i think the the proof is there that many people have been suffering <laughs> over the introduction of these type of software so this is changing now with software i think um you know gartner has now a quote magic country a low code software and thinks that it can more be fitted into an, an corporate environment rather than the corporate environment needs to be kind of fitting into the limitations of the software. So I think that is really important because as you run the change, you have to focus on the fact that although this is a corporate solution, we're doing this because it's going to benefit also you. You need to be able to listen to their requirements and be very, very detailed and empathetic about what they need to achieve whilst at the same time being very clear about the benefits that this will have for everyone. And I love this. Uh, I took a note of, of a KPI here, which could potentially be on-time payment, for instance. Uh, we are getting some new KPIs from our community as well around maybe starting to collect the supplier NPS score. How well the suppliers actually like to, to work with us. Marketing has been using this for a long time. Um, why not? You know, procurement can do it as well. Um, in fact, Mondelez is thinking about it. I think they're a little bit worried about the score itself, uh, but they're thinking about maybe introducing a KPI such as, as this. Um, and, and there will be other you know, KPIs around how can we maybe reduce the cost of serve to our supply chain in working with us? Because if you have 20 odd supplier facing platforms, you have to fill in all the information time and time again, and it's, it's really difficult. What can unkinking of that supply chain mean in terms of added benefit to the supply chain? Half, you know, part of it can potentially come back to you. But starting to tracking those metrics, I think will give a lot of commitment to the supply chain that you're taking this seriously, and will also have, you know, can bring some positive reinforcement to the to the reason for why you're transforming this uh, as well. And that actually goes back to your point, Ragnar, about bringing in those startups. I mean, if there's one thing, right, that anybody's going to take away from this, it's that you can't bring in a bunch of startups and say you're really important, we want your disruptive innovation, and then not pay them on time. <laughs> Little start, you cannot do that. You gotta, if anything, you pay them early, that, right? They've got no cash flow, no capital. And the more disruptive they are, probably the less access to capital they have. And so that becomes that much more important if you think you're gonna bring in these smaller companies. Well, the, you know, the interesting I, I thing is- I mean, another thing here, I think for big companies to think about is, uh, what is their attitude in working with smaller organizations? I yeah. feel sometimes that big companies think because you're small, we have we can dictate everything. You know, we can call the shots, and you will just align. You're just happy should be happy for doing business with us. That mind change, uh, that mindset needs to be changing as well. I think. Great point, and, and I should also wanted to add beyond the startup aspect of what you are talking about. We saw it happen with more established companies and, and, and middle stage companies that were key parts of the aviation supply chains, for example. Yes. Uh, I saw Boeing 
uh, ex Boeing and other companies ex expedite payments to protect that supply chain as it was waiting to get the clearance for the, um, uh, the yeah, the, the, the max, uh, program back. Um, and, and by the way, they've got some 400 aircraft in inventory. Can you imagine managing that inventory? Uh, holy cow. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, by the way, Ragnar nicely done. That was a big question. <laughs> and and really uh, very well done in, in three or four minutes time. Uh, I want to pose this question. You know, we're hearing a lot about and, and this if it's a curveball, we, we can always take it offline. Uh, low code, no code and, and how it's impact really across industry. As Ali has got this question here and I'm going to pose it and feel free to weigh in. And, and again, we can always save it. She says, hey, do you think software will need to be more customizable or possibly created? in-house any comments from all three of y'all on that question <laughs> jeff go ahead yeah yeah no for me it's, it's fundamental we talk about digitalization you know i'll talk about our, our company for a second but we've embraced it right we embrace the the, the localized coding the the simplistic coding you've got lots of platforms out there right you got your automation anyway you got your other uh, power bi tool, tool sets office 365 all of these for someone that's not technically savvy, right? The traditional coding, the folks like us that maybe uh, played around with access and some databases and our own internal coding, right? But the new generation, they adopt these new tools fantastically. They're quick to, to assimilate solutions, right? And I think O365 is a good example of this where you can create so many real-time agile solutions with no real significant infrastructure that are solving real problems. And I think this is the fundamentals when you have uh, the mindset, and it's been said several times today, right? I mean, putting the mindset in place about digitalization, about process improvement, it's on the ground. It's not the executive saying, this must be better and, and you're going to be more efficient. No, you need the guys that are doing the work to say, you know what, why am I doing this work? And if we just had this solution, then it would fix. And if you give them the tools to do that on top of it, then odds are you're going to see a lot of quick wins in a very short amount of time. Excellent point that the old adage with them, what's in it for me is still yeah. alive and well these days. Uh, Ragnar... <laughs> Yeah, maybe a comment on this. Um, it's probably driven with some context is what I'm sensing uh, when you get a question like this. You know, companies 20, 30 years ago, they they built software in-house <laughs> and then enterprise software were developed. And that was a generally a very positive thing. Uh, but I think a lot of companies now the last you know, 10, 20 years have seen themselves a little bit fed up by not fitting in and having to customize the software. And you're ending up with a beast that you have to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. So companies are now increasingly being pushed into thinking, do we need to develop some in-house tool again? Because that gives us the flexibility to change this and it's going to be cheaper. Sure, there's going to be a maintenance uh, type of element to it and we're not IT posting experts either. But I think this is where no and low code kind of comes in, where you can buy the tool set off the shelf and then you can build the skill internally to be able to configure and change ongoingly. And then this is the, kind of the key trend that we are seeing uh, a big adoption for in the market. Excellent. I th I th and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that. Just, and we love the democratic, um, the democracy, uh, democratization, easy for you to say, democratization <laughs> of technology. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Jeff, I'm here to humor you, my friend. I'll tell you, stick around, you'll see me butcher all kinds of names. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, it's a, it's such an empowering force, mm -hmm. and it, I, I think in many in so many ways is such a force for good. It's going to advance us all and empower folks, regardless of of department and function and and longevity in, in the industry. So appreciate y'all both uh, addressing Azalea's question. Okay, one quick one more quick comment here from Philip. Uh, payments getting a lot of attention here. As a small business, I'd es estimate that at least three fourths of invoices are paid late. Well, hey. Our controller here at Supply Chain Now, Vicky White, is on it, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and and I, <laughs> I fear for any of our suppliers. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, what a great conversation here today, wide ranging. Ragnar, to your point, we never have enough time no. to dive into um, so, so many of these elements that, that come to the surface. But Kelly, before we bid adieu to uh, Jeff and Ragnar, what do we want to uh, wrap up on here today? So I think for me, this works into be sort of what I think is going to be part of the introductory dial P merch line, right? Oh, nice. If we think about Ragnar's point, procurement proud, think about the nature of this conversation. There's no complaining about procurement not having a seat at the table. There's no complaining about savings. We're looking at the top line. 
right? These are, yes, procurement supply chain conversations, but these are company-wide, broad objective, right? Business continuity, profitability type of conversations. And, and I think when you can take something that big and complex and boil it down into the diagram, right? It, we have to have these enormous goals, but they have to be very clear very easy to explain, very easy to understand, because that's sort of where the rubber is going to meet the road. So I think what a fantastic conversation. We just went way beyond supplier information, but I think you have to. That's that's the goal. It's not just about the data. It's it's so what, right? And, and I think we got there. Agreed. Nothing's just about anything these days, no. it seems. So um, all right. Well, we really enjoyed this conversation. we got to make sure our, our community knows how to connect with both of y'all, right? Uh, so Jeff Ostrander, let's start with you. Uh, how can folks connect with and compare notes with him? Yeah, for sure. LinkedIn, always easiest. Uh, I know there's been a lot of run up to this show. I've gotten a lot of, uh, to Kelly's point, as a big community, a lot of people yeah. touching base already. So, so great on that. Uh, always easiest for sure. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Jeff. And uh, Ragnar, I think you mentioned earlier Mondelez International, one of the leading food uh, uh, manufacturers in the world. Quentin Roach, their chief procurement officer, is going to be joining us for the March edition of Dial yes. P. And I think um, a member of the Hicks team will be joining us as well. So we, we look forward to that. Um, all right. So Ragnar, same question to you. How can folks connect with you and the Hicks organization? Well, obviously through our website, that would be one thing. Uh, personally on LinkedIn, that would probably be the easiest as well. Um, we're very excited around supplier experience management and the issues people are having around data management. So if anyone wants to have a debate, whether you like it or load our ideas, would uh, <laughs> welcome that discussion and uh, feel free to get in touch. Outstanding. So uh, Kelly, I've got 27 pages of notes here today, I believe. And 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 we're, I'm going to give you a pop quiz once we swoosh Jeff and Ragnar out. So stay All tuned right. for that. Um, now, nah, kidding aside, what a really, really enjoyed meeting both of y'all. We should have recorded, as always, the pre-show uh, discussion, but we'll have to have you back. So Jeff Ostrander, head of supply transactions, Western Hemisphere for Slumberger. Great to see you, Jeff. And Ragnar Lawrenson, chief commercial officer with Hicks. Thanks to you both. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey, hey, the swoosh was on time. Kelly, please don't <laughs> make me say democratization ever again in a lot. Or Schlumberger or Hicks <laughs> or Ragnar's last name. <laughs> oh, God. We took you on know, a big challenge this show. Oh, no kidding. Uh, and hey, uh, uh, for someone pointing to myself that can get his kids names wrong pretty regularly, <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad Ragnar and Jeff had a great sense of humor and Man, talk about the to your point earlier. It, we didn't. It, it was a very broad and hopefully a really practical and informative conversation. At least it was on my end. What do you think? No, I thought it was as well. I mean, and, and seriously, I I made the point when we talked a little bit about the wrap up. I am so proud that we're able to have these conversations. I'm thrilled with the points and the questions that we got from the audience, and I think we're really starting to think big. And it's it's about thinking about expansive challenges, but it's also about thinking company-wide. I mean, nothing that's worth doing can be done entirely within any one function anymore. And so X. the more we tie everything to, and so what, you know, okay, what's the number 12? So what, what do we do with that? What's our, what's our next step? Um, to me, that's an indication that we're focused in the right place. Excellent point. Excellent point. Uh, let's share a couple comments here. So David, Hey, thanks for that. Great show today, guys flow so well David. together. David, we got to get you on. We'd love to get you on a live stream here uh, soon. Uh, Adrian says, Hey, late payments, Philip Otteson can have Ooh, an evil ripple effect. That's an excellent supply. point because <laughs> small is, suppliers have small suppliers. Right. Yeah. Appreciate the uh, feedback from Azalea and Sean as well. And Philip says, Hey, looks like I need to hire Vicky. No, you can't have her. <laughs> Uh, so, um, but lights are flicking around here. So we're gonna have to wrap up quick. I'm hoping that our local, uh, power company is not, uh -oh. in not encountering some of the challenges of other parts of the country, but we got a, just a couple of quick, uh, events I want to share. Uh, and Vicki, while I pull this up or Vicki Kelly, while I pull this up, uh, let's make sure we, that folks know the date of the next dial P uh next month but in the meantime while you track that down uh, yeah. i want to invite the community to join us for our webinar tomorrow we were touched on digital transformation today 
We're going to be focused on supply chain transformation tomorrow with Canaxis and Will Berry from Mars Global. So y'all join us for that 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thursday, we're talking so much about startups unexpectedly yeah. today, uh, Kelly. Thursday, it's going to be take your shot. It's going to be I have this on chain. my calendar. I can't wait for this. Uh, well, hopefully, you know, you'll have to you have to sit in on it as a judge in a future edition. Uh, but big thanks to Shane Riser and Carrie Davis, who are our uh, co-producers for this new show on Tequila Sunrise. So don't miss that Thursday at twelve noon, thirty minutes, three pitches, three judges, three founders. All in 30 minutes time. So stay tuned for that. And of course, you can learn a lot more about any of this at supplychainnow.com, including seeing fe- uh, previous episodes of uh, Dial P. And we're going to have a, a library of them by the time we're That's said and done. Right. But Kelly, when is the next Dial P live stream? We're actually lucky. It's real easy. So today's February 16th, March 16th, same time, slightly different place. 12 noon Eastern, third Tuesday of every month, Dial P runs live. We're going to awesome. paint the town red. Love it. All right. So as we wrap here, um, before I sign off, is there any one big key takeaway that you want to share? Or do you want to challenge our community with one big challenge? Kelly, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm going to issue a challenge. And this is all around taking the supplier attitude and making it actionable. Pick one supplier, ask them a challenging question you don't already know the answer to and listen to what they say. Mm-hmm. That's sounds simple. That's a challenge. Listen to what that supplier has to say. Love that. Don't be thinking about how you're going to respond. Really listen intently and see what they're trying to, what they're nope. communicating and maybe what they're trying to communicate too, right? And if you're lucky, it'll be hard to hear. That's how you know you're getting a valuable <laughs> response. If it's hard to hear what that supplier has to tell you. Love that. What a great note to wrap up on. Kelly Barner, always a pleasure. Where can folks learn more about Buyers Meeting Point? They can either visit me at buyersmeetingpoint.com or like Ragnar and Jeff, you just look me up on LinkedIn. I will be glad to hear from anybody. Let us know what you think of the show. Awesome. Thanks so much. Big thanks, of course, to our guests, Ragnar and Jeff. Big thanks to Amanda and Clay behind the scenes. And most importantly, big thanks to Kelly and our community that showed up and, and brought it once again here today. So stay tuned. Hope to see you back in February for what should be an uh, equally interesting and intriguing follow-up conversation. So with with that said, be sure to check us out at supplychainnow.com. Scott Luton on behalf of our entire team here, wishing our listeners and our community and, and all of you out there nothing but the best. Hey, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. On that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.